Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. By the second half of the Permian period, the synapsids remained the dominant lineage of terrestrial animals and had adapted to a huge variety of ecological niches, ranging from tiny burrowing herbivores to large bear-sized apex predators. While the saber-toothed Gorgonopsians are probably the most famous examples of the latter, other groups of more derived proto-mammal carnivores also radiated wildly starting by around 266 million years ago. These include the eutheriodonts, which were the most mammal-like of the Permian synapsids, and developed features that include the loss of teeth on the palate, the expansion of the epipterygoid bone at the base of the skull, and the narrowing of the skull roof to a sagittal crest running between large temporal openings. These are all anatomical traits shared with modern mammals, with some fossil evidence also suggesting that eutheriodonts possessed whiskers and hairy coats, although we still don't know how extensive these furry coverings were. The presence of hair, as well as the development of secondary palates in the mouth, which enabled these animals to eat and breathe at the same time, suggests that the presence of endothermic metabolisms. By around 265 million years ago, eutheriodonts split into two separate lineages, with one divergence leading to the cynodonts, which famously survived into the Triassic and would later give rise to the true mammals. The other group, the Thoracophalians, became successful carnivores during the second half of the Permian alongside the Gorgonopsians, but unlike the latter, survived into the early Triassic. In fact, the earliest and most basal Thoracophalians would have strongly resembled the Gorgonopsians as well, being powerful ambush predators with elongated sabre-like canines. These animals may have originated in what is now South Africa, and soon spread quickly across much of Pangaea. Early forms such as Lycosuchus were quite typical, being sturdy carnivores with large skulls and bodies that generally measured over one metre long. The widespread family Psylacosauridae were present across what is now Russia and South Africa, ranging from dog to leopard-sized, and hunted contemporary Dicynodonts and Pariasaurs. The largest forms were animals like Glanosuchus, a 1.8 metre long animal with a deep long snout equipped with stabbing up at canines. This genus is represented by quite complete skull material, which have enabled paleontologists to get a good look inside its well-preserved brain case and inner ear. In life, Ganosuchus possessed a very thin bony eardrum and an inner ear condition about halfway between the earlier therapsids and modern mammals in terms of development. While its sense of hearing would not have been as acute as in living mammals, it would have been significantly more developed than in more basal synapsids. In addition, well-preserved bridges in the nasal cavity suggest that Ganosuchus and other early Thoracophalians may have had the elevated metabolisms that were not yet fully endothermic. It still shared some features of the snout with those of sauropsid reptiles and early synapsids, such as possessing coani, two holes in the palate that connect the nasal cavity to the mouth, that were positioned far forward, rather than further back as in mammals. This suggests that Glanosuchus lacked a secondary palate, and thus had a slower metabolism than later Thoracophalians and Cynodonts, which developed this trait independently. The Russian Gorinicus from the Middle Permian is represented by two species, with these being the more massive G. sundriensis, which is about the size of a large wolf, and the smaller G. masutini, which is more comparable to a coyote. It lived alongside the small, potentially nocturnal Gorgonopsian Nochnitsa, being part of a trend wherein the more massive basal Thoracophalians, which had quickly become apex predators after the mid-Permian extinction event, lost ground to the Gorgonopsians by the late Permian. This led to the more derived Thoracophalian generally shrinking in size and developing faster metabolisms. One group representative of these changes were the Achidnonathids, some of which possessed odd adaptations not seen in other Thoracophalians. While still predatory, these animals were notably smaller than their more basal relatives, with most forms being comparable to badgers and small dogs in terms of size. The genus Euchambecia, from the late Permian of South Africa, was tiny, no bigger than a Jack Russell Terrier, and possessed a short, blunt skull with prominent canines, which were indented with prominent grooves. This is similar to some modern mammals that have venomous bites, such as shrews and the selenodon, with some paleontologists suggesting that Euchambecia may have also utilised venom in bringing down small endothermic prey. This is not universally accepted, however, 
as many mammals also have grooved canines and are not at all venomous, such as baboons. Another small member of the group, the badger-sized Anatherapsidus, was a long-bodied animal with a distinctly flattened skull equipped with backward-curving teeth. These adaptations may be indications of a semi-aquatic niche, with the genus being native to what would have then been a broad floodplain during the late Permian of Russia. By the very end of the Permian, some echidnonathids grew larger again, perhaps due to being present in environments lacking Gorgonopsian competitors. The genus Moscherinus was native to the late Permian of South Africa and measured up to 1.5 metres long, with the largest known skulls of this animal being comparable to those of lions. It possessed a blunt, boxy snout with powerful and enlarged incisors which resembled the canines of modern felids such as the clouded leopard. Combined with strong neck muscles and a shearing bite, Mosha Rhinus would have been a formidable cat-like ambush predator, hunting contemporary dicynodons with a clamping hold to the throat or the abdomen. The genus managed to survive the end Permian mass extinction event, probably as a result of the continued presence of Lystrosaurus across the boundary. Although early Triassic examples of Mosha Rhinus were notably smaller than their Permian ancestors, this is almost certainly due to the stresses of a harsher climate during and after the extinction with the genus dying out roughly 251 million years ago. A more poorly known group of Thoracophalians from the late Permian were the Wyatseoids, most of which seem to have been small badger-like carnivores. The exception appears to have been the Russian genus Megawyatsia, which is only known from fragments of jawbone which contain canals that run down into the teeth. This was once thought to indicate the presence of venom glands, although this is generally no longer thought to be the case. The complete skull had been estimated to measure up to 50 centimetres long, indicating that this genus was a massive animal about the size of a modern tiger, certainly being the apex predator of late Permian Western Russia. No Gorgonopsians have been found alongside Megawyatsia, indicating that they may have gone extinct in this region due to cooling climatic conditions, with the presumably higher metabolisms and possible hairy coats of Wyatseids enabling them to take over. However, perhaps the most successful of all Thoracophalians were the Baurioids, which were the smallest and generally most mammal-like members of this clade. First appearing near the end of the Permian, and surviving as late as the Middle Triassic, these would have quite strongly resembled their Cynodont cousins, being modestly sized, active, and probably hairy carnivores and insectivores. The relatively basal form Regisaurus was a strange-looking animal, with long legs, a short tail, and a robust, powerful skull. About the size of a small dog, it dwelt in what is now South Africa during the early Triassic, with its ancestors being survivors of the end Permian mass extinction. It would have lived alongside the very common Lystrosaurus, and would have fed on insects and a variety of small vertebrates, including the lizard-like parareptiles Oenetta and Procolophon. Most other baurioids that survived into the Triassic were also small animals, such as the long-snouted genus Tetracynodon, which is about the size of a cat. One of the more unusual members of this group was Ericio Lacerta, a tiny genus whose name means hedgehog lizard. Measuring just 20 centimeters long, with a semi-sprawling posture and proportionally large head, this little animal probably lived much like a modern hedgehog, scampering about in the undergrowth and feeding mostly on insects and other invertebrates. It lived in both South Africa and Antarctica during the early Triassic, in environments that would have been quite cold at night, suggesting that Ericeo Lacerta was probably at least somewhat furry. The youngest of the Thoracophalians were the Bauriids, which were the most mammal-like members of the clade, convergently developing wide, crushing post-canine teeth, which were analogous to the molars of mammals. These occluding teeth enabled the Bauriids to include plant matter in their diets, unlike all other Thoracophalians. The genus Bauria was native to South Africa until roughly 246 million years ago, and is known from well-preserved skulls, revealing a badger-like omnivorous animal with complex differentiated teeth. A close relative, Microgomphodon, was similar but possessed a shorter snout and lived in what is now South Africa and Namibia. This was the youngest known Thoracophalian, persisting in the Omnigonde formation of Namibia until potentially 242 million years ago. It was the only Thoracophalian here, and lived alongside a variety of Dicynodonts and Cynodonts, 
which were even more mammal-like therapsids that moved into the niches once taken by the beast heads. By the late Triassic, these had given rise to the true mammals, leaving the Thoracophalians as an interesting side branch that developed many features that converged on mammals proper. As successful as they were, in the end they probably lost out to the more derived Cynodonts. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the rise of the Ornithurines, the ancestors of all modern birds that were common and widespread during the Cretaceous. See you again soon. Cheerio.